My kids have never been to a talk of mine. They've been to my wife's talks numerous times. But not yours. What's that? Yeah. All right. Thank you, everybody. We're going to go ahead and get started. Um, thank you for coming out here on a Tuesday night to the Harrow Hoteling Memorial Lecture Series. This lecture series was founded to honor one of our esteemed scholars and colleagues. <clears throat> Harold Hotelling joined Lawrence Tech as an associate professor of economics in 1989, taught business law, business ethics, constitutional law, urban social issues, law and economics. His life was marked by an unwavering dedication to his family, church, and his students, and his profession. Everyone who knew him loved him. He was an amazing colleague to a, a lot of different people. He was he had a keen intellect, tireless devotion, quick wit, and a wonderful sense of humor. His contributions to Lawrence Tech will always be remembered for the endowment that this family has given for this lecture series, so we can do this on a yearly basis. But more importantly, he'll be also remembered as a great person and a dear friend. So uh, fortunately, his wife Barbara would normally come, wasn't able to come this year um, due to traveling issues of getting here. But so this year, uh, they're not here. But um, I want to thank Harold and his family for everything that they've done for this. So now I get to announce our speaker, but our administrator, Sherry, made this wonderful flyer that she put on this poster in nice frame. She does a really nice job, by the way. And so I thought this is a great opportunity for Vivian and the boys and Paul to come down and take a picture, because I would like to go ahead and give this to Ben as uh, a token of our appreciation for coming out for our series tonight. Thank you for that, Ben. All right, so now I have the pleasure of introducing our speaker, Dr. Ben Pauley, who is an associate professor of social science at Kettering University in Flint, Michigan. He's the author of the book, Flint Fights Back, Environmental Justice and Democracy in the Flint Water Crisis. He's an acting chair of the Flint Water System Advisory Council president of the Board of Environmental Transformation Movement of Flint, and a member of the National Environmental Justice Advisory Council to the US EPA. You do a lot of work. Keep yourself very busy. It's almost been 10 years since the Flint water crisis, a crisis that really exposed um, a lot of issues with our country's infrastructure, but also exposed a lot of issues with environmental injustices. And he's going to talk tonight about how, over the last 10 years, changes in environmental injustices and in environmental justice has occurred, what has happened, what has led to new and improved things, and where we really are today and where we still need to go. The title of his talk is Flint and the Future of the Environmental Justice. Ben, thank you for coming out here tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much for the introduction and, and thanks to everybody who decided to come out tonight. Um, I'm honored that you're here. I'm, I'm um, touched by the token of appreciation. Um, I better not mess this up now. If I do, feel free to take it back. Um, <clears throat> you have that, that leverage. So um, anyway, I'd also like to express my gratitude to the College of Arts and Sciences uh, for the invitation to deliver the 2023 Harold Hotelling Memorial Lecture. This is actually my second time speaking at Lawrence Tech. Um, some of you will remember that I gave a talk back in 2017 um, as part of the Idea Factory speaker series that also had something to do with, with Flint. Um, the, the topic of that talk was contrasting narratives of the Flint water crisis. And at that time, uh, back in 2017, there had only been an officially recognized Flint water crisis for about a year and a half, 
Um, and the recovery effort was still very much ongoing, in some ways just getting started with respect to the replacement of lead service lines and so forth. Um, and there was controversy at that time over some of the basic facts on the ground in Flint. So federal and state officials were pretty much ready to declare water quality in Flint restored, um, even though they didn't explicitly use that language. That was basically what they were saying at the time. And many residents, as you might imagine, imagine were uh, skeptical of that message, um, in part because they still felt like they had good evidence to the contrary. So there were some interesting and, and pretty consequential divides on the level of just basic fact claims about the water. And I ended up uh, writing about some of that in my book. Um, but I was also interested in different ways of thinking about the origins and the significance of the crisis. And that's really where the stuff about different narratives came in. Um, what I was noticing was that there were different ways of telling the story of the crisis that had different starting points, that used very different framings, and that had pretty different implications with respect to what we were supposed to learn from the crisis and do about it. So I won't get into them in, in any detail here, but um, just to summarize briefly, um, I identified what I, I called a technical narrative of the crisis that emphasizes water treatment missteps, a historical narrative of the crisis that tries to weave together all of the various historical factors that made Flint vulnerable to crisis in the first place, and then finally a political narrative of the crisis that centers the story on political actors and ideologies that contributed to the crisis. What I want to talk about today, though, is another kind of framing of the crisis, one that treats it as a paradigmatic example of environmental injustice. Uh, among some of the commentary uh, on the headlines uh, coming out of Flint in, the early, in early 2016, uh, one could find no less an authority than Robert Bullard, widely regarded as the father of environmental justice scholarship, describing Flint as, quote, the latest poster child for environmental justice. Thank you. And that was one of uh, many similar examples of describing Flint uh, in, with that terminology. Um, when I gave my earlier talk here, um, I was still very much on the steep part of the learning curve with respect to environmental justice. The concept was pretty new to me, at least I hadn't given it a whole lot of thought before. Um, I'd thought some about environmental issues, and I'd thought a lot about issues of justice, particularly so-called social justice, but I hadn't thought too much about their intersection. How is it, anyway, that uh, environmental matters become matters of justice, especially if we're talking about justice as it pertains to relationships between people, as opposed to relationships between people and animals or the natural world more generally? Well, what, part of what I came to understand is that environmental quality, and here I'm, I'm construing environment broadly. So it's, it's not just the natural world out there, but um, it's also the physical environments that we find ourselves in on a daily basis. Um, environmental quality is one of the basic goods that human beings require to live in safety and dignity. And as with other basic goods, say things like food or education, societies have a good deal of influence over how environmental quality is distributed over who has access to things like clean air and water and soil. Societies also have influence over who is most exposed to environmental bads, like contamination. When some people have less access to environmental goods and more exposure to environmental bads, then it's an environmental inequality. And when there's no good reason for that inequality, when it stems from active discrimination or social marginalization, or structural barriers of racism and poverty, we are dealing with environmental injustice. So from this perspective, the Flint water crisis is an environmental injustice because it represents an undeserved form of unequal treatment. 
stemming from environmental contamination. Now, any community can find itself the victim of unequal treatment, but environmental justice advocates have been keen to show that Flint is part of a pattern of unfair treatment that affects some kinds of communities more than others. Many studies over the last four decades from Robert Bullard's, and I'm going to try out the laser pointer here. Let's see if I can get that going. Okay. Um, from Robert Bullard's uh, pioneering work on solid waste siting in Houston uh, to the influential report Toxic Wastes and Race in the United States to this very recent analysis of exposure to fine particulates across different categories of people. Um, many, many studies have shown that poor communities and communities of color like Flint are more likely than others to be forced to live with environmental hazards and to suffer from environmental contamination. So take the example of lead, the contaminant in Flint that got the most attention after a 2015 analysis showed elevated blood lead levels in Flint children after the switch of the city's drinking water supply to the Flint River. Well, when we started comparing blood lead levels um, across racial and class categories way back whenever that was, uh, it became clear immediately that there were huge disparities. Children of color and lower income children have always been much more likely to have higher blood lead levels. And even today, uh, we find the highest median blood lead levels among black children in particular. The good news with lead is that overall levels of lead in blood have plummeted over the past uh, several decades and the racial and class gap has closed some too. But we have to remember that the effects of lead exposure reverberate over generations. So we're still going to be dealing with a significant amount of inequality and injustice from past as well as present exposures for the foreseeable future. Let's talk about a contaminant that's gotten a, a lot less attention than lead, um, Legionella. In Flint, we uh, had a historic outbreak of Legionnaire's disease in the summers of 2014 and 2015. There were many, many cases of the disease. At least 12 people died, maybe many more. Arguably, this was the worst public health outcome, actually, of the entire Flint water crisis. But it's not just Flint. When you look at rates of Legionnaire's disease uh, nationwide, what you find is a clear racial disparity. African Americans are about twice as likely to contract the disease. And unlike with lead, both the overall cases and the size of the disparity is increasing. Okay, so advancing environmental justice means reducing or eliminating these kinds of disparities, hopefully while also reducing exposures and harms for everybody. We want to make sure that we don't generate any more of these disparities as well. And from that perspective, we need to look at how the disparities arise in the first place and whether different decisions could have prevented them. Uh, it's been argued in the case of Flint, uh, thinking back to what I called the political narrative of the crisis a moment ago, that poisoned democracy led to poisoned water. Critical decisions about Flint's water source and treatment were made by unelected, unaccountable non-residents, including so-called emergency managers appointed by Governor Rick Snyder to oversee Flint's uh, affairs. Among Flint's environmental justice activists anyway, there's a strong belief that undemocratic decision-making processes create unjust outcomes. And the flip side of this view is that democratic processes will create just outcomes. And I think um, this was beautifully stated by one of our leading water activists, Claire McClinton, um, who told me that if we control our water, it's not going to get poisoned. Now, um, we could argue about whether things always work out that way, um, whether the things we control end up, you know, <laughs> not harming us. Um, but uh, we might at least agree with Winston Churchill that democracy is uh, sort of the best of our bad options as a species for making decisions, that it's more likely to produce unjust, out or sorry, just outcomes uh, 
than the alternatives. Um, so concern with fair and inclusive decision-making processes, or what's sometimes called procedural justice, has become deeply embedded in environmental justice thinking. And we can see this in the Environmental Protection Agency's oft-cited definition of environmental justice, which incorporates both of the elements we've been talking about thus far. Fairness in the distribution of environmental goods and bads, the terminology they use is fair treatment there, and fairness in terms of who is able to participate meaningfully in the process of environmental decision making. That's the meaningful involvement part, and you can see that it has a number of different elements. Um, it's not as easy to throw up some statistics on how far we have to go as a society on the meaningful involvement front, um, but suffice to say, Flint is far from the only place where decisions about water and other environmental matters are being made in a top-down fashion by people who don't have to live with the consequences. So Flint can help us to understand that facet of environmental injustice as well. So up to this point, we've been talking about environmental justice as an idea, um, as a set of principles, as a framework for understanding a certain kind of social inequality. But it's also a movement for social change. And again, Flint is a great example of what that looks like at the local level. We probably wouldn't be sitting here talking about a Flint water crisis at all if ordinary Flint residents hadn't spoken out and marched and organized in various ways, including forming coalitions, started filing lawsuits, petitioning people like uh, Mayor Walling here, and collecting their own data about the contamination. Flint, in many ways, is exemplary in the way in which it, it brought all of these things together. But we can point to similar examples all over the country of local environmental justice movements coming together and having a big impact. Um, and what I'd like to focus on in the rest of this talk um, is um, the history and the significance of the larger environmental justice movement. And I'm going to be focusing less on the local level, even though you know, I would argue that that's kind of where the beating heart of the environmental justice movement is. It's, it's in addressing issues that are impacting everyday people in their everyday lives right there in their communities. But there's also been a broader national movement, um, a constellation of people and groups that to some extent have coordinated their efforts and try to make, tried to make change at the supra-local scale. So um, the metaphor I'm about to use is, is overused, I will admit that, but um, often when we talk about movements for social change, we talk about waves. And there is something a little bit wave-like about the trajectory of that larger environmental justice movement. And this is just one very imperfect way of visualizing what I'm talking about. But what you see here is uh, an analysis through the Google Books Ngram viewer. I don't know if anybody's familiar with this, but you can uh, type in whatever your search term is, and it'll search the entire Google Books archive for instances of that term. So I did that with the term environmental justice. So you can see um, when it starts to appear and how frequently it appears over time within the Google Books uh, database. So the term is coined sometime in the late 1970s. Uh, it begins to take off in popularity in the 80s, and it peaks in the mid-90s or so before starting to fall off pretty sharply. And what I think this shows pretty clearly is the kind of first surge of excitement around environmental justice, not just because it was a new idea, but because the demands associated with it seem to be gaining political traction even at the highest levels. Um, and I think the fall off that you see in the 90s there is explained in part by the feeling that that traction hadn't led to much substantive change. So there was a little bit of disillusionment that uh, crept in right around that time. What you see right around the time that the news about Flint is starting to break, so if you look at uh, you know, 2015 getting into 2016 there, 
um, is that the, the curve starts bending back upward. People are getting interested in environmental justice again. Increasingly, it's being recognized as one of the big issues of the day. And part of the reason I'd like to suggest is that new opportunities to make large-scale lasting change were starting to open up. Um, so the data represented here ends in 2019, and that's unfortunate for our purposes. Where did my pen go? There we go. Because I think what we'll see ultimately is that this line just keeps going up, up, up over these next several years because some of the biggest developments that we're going to be talking about tonight have happened just in the last two or three years. Um, so, uh, you know, I'd like to go so far as to suggest that what we might be seeing here is a second quote-unquote wave, right, this being the first one. Um, so, you know, as I said earlier, um, what I'm trying to capture here is the, the salience in the impact of environmental justice at a large scale, not the ups and downs of local struggles. But um, in some especially notable cases, local struggles have had an oversized influence in shaping these contours and even setting the waves in motion. So I, you know, I've already hinted at what I suppose is the main thesis of this talk, which is that the Flint water crisis has played a significant role in setting off the second wave. But before we talk about that wave, I wanna talk a little bit about the first because that will help us to understand where things stood before the water crisis came along. At the beginning of that first wave too, uh, what we find is a local struggle of historic significance, namely the struggle against a toxic waste dump in Warren County, North Carolina. And if you don't know this story, it's kind of a crazy story. Um, Sometime in 1978, some uh, really upstanding individuals with the Ward PCB Transformer Company got the bright idea to dispose of a bunch of PCB contaminated oil by loading it into a tanker truck and then driving that truck along 240 miles of North Carolina Highway with the cap open, uh, thus uh, spilling the toxic fluid into the soil on the side of the highway. Um, then the state had to figure out what to do with all of this contaminated soil. And uh, eventually it was decided to concentrate it in a dump in Warren County, uh, North Carolina, which just so happened to be 69% African American and 20% poor. Unsurprisingly, uh, people living in the area were not thrilled about the prospect of living next to this dump. I mean, you see them lying down in the road here to block the dump trucks, that's how serious they were. Um, but it went beyond that. And that's really what's important for our purposes. Nobody wants to live next to a dump. What was called out in Warren County, though, really for the first time in the context of social activism, was the larger pattern of foisting pollution on black and brown communities disproportionately. That pattern was labeled by movement leaders like Benjamin Chavez, environmental racism. And increasingly, people from communities that had experienced similar problems started to connect and work together. Famously, um, they joined up in Washington, D.C. in 1991 at the first National People of Color Environmental Leadership Summit, where the 17 principles of environmental justice were developed. And this is often seen as the moment when the movement kind of cohered. And the, the powers that be were taking some notice of all of this uh, around this time. So in 1992, the George H.W. Bush administration established within EPA the Office of Environmental Equity, later renamed the Office of Environmental Justice, and the next year, um, the Clinton administration established the National Environmental Justice Advisory Council to EPA. That's the thing I've been serving on for a few years, um, which is a, a way of um, bringing EPA into contact and communication with community organizations, state and local government, 
academia and the business sector, of course, <laughs> around issues of environmental justice. Most notably, in 1994, this guy here, Clint, uh, uh, Flynn was, was looking at this picture and asking, who, who is that guy? <laughs> he doesn't recognize Bill Clinton, of course. This was way before his time, but he was once upon a time the president. I know even for the students here, this is like ancient history, but once upon a time there was this guy called Bill Clinton who was president. And um, he signed an executive order in 1994 uh, clarifying that seeking environmental justice was not just the responsibility of one small office in EPA, but was the responsibility of all federal agencies. They were all supposed to make this some kind of a priority or at least part of their agenda. And uh, he, this is also established the so-called interagency work group on environmental justice, and they're supposed to use that to coordinate all their environmental justice activities. So uh, this was the beginning of the institutionalization of environmental justice within the federal government. And, you know, that was no small thing. These were wins for the movement on some level. Uh, but the question was, to what extent was all of this trickling down into real change in communities? Well, let's talk a little bit more about what kinds of changes these communities are typically looking for vis-a-vis -vis government. And I'd like to focus on three in particular. Firstly, um, they're looking f often for more consistent and aggressive enforcement of rules and regulations that are already on the books. As I'm sure you know, there's often quite a bit of room for interpretation when it comes to what rules require you to do. You know, we, we tell our kids, you know, not too much screen time, but uh, their interpretation of too much screen time, it turns out, is much different from ours. So anyway, the interpretation part really matters. Um, and so often, you know, what environmental justice communities are looking for is just more rigorous enforcement of the rules that are already there. Secondly, um, in some cases, they're calling for stronger rules and regulations. So let's actually change the uh, language of the rules. Um, for example, rules that are more protective of vulnerable populations that give um, environmental agencies the power to deny new projects and proposals on environmental justice grounds. We'll talk about that later on. And then thirdly, people in these communities are often looking also for resources, resources for environmental remediation to address existing injustices. So on all three of these fronts, Progress from the mid-90s on was not ultimately as significant as a lot of people hoped it would be. So with respect to the enforcement of existing rules, there's a lot we could talk about. I mean, scholarship has shown that environmental laws just don't get enforced as rigorously often in communities of color. Um, but what I'd like to focus on is one of the central aspirations of the movement, namely to use federal civil rights law to block environmentally destructive projects in majority minority communities. So you recall that those activists we saw a moment ago who were fighting the PCB dump in um, Warren County described the siting of that dump as environmental racism by which they meant that you know, it was an act of racial discrimination to put that dump there. And in fact, they explicitly framed that struggle as having inaugurated a new chapter in the civil rights movement. You know, we've combated at that time, you know, to some extent, <laughs> discrimination in the schools and in the, you know, military and uh, in housing, in employment. Now the thinking was that it's time to fight discrimination in the environmental realm. Right? That's part of the civil rights movement. Um, but it remained to be seen whether the federal government would be willing to use existing civil rights laws to block environmental discrimination. And the key law here um, that I'm going to be referring to is Title VI of the Civil Rights Act, which you might have heard of, which prohibits discrimination on the grounds of race, color, or national origin by any entity receiving federal money. And that includes, by the way, state environmental permitting agencies. And uh, this is a really important source of leverage for the federal government because uh, if it determines you've been discriminating, it can take your money away, 
least some of your money away, and uh, that's not a small thing for a state agency. Um, so starting in the 90s, environmental justice activists began to use the tactic of appealing to Title VI to try and get the feds to intervene and stop specific projects. And wouldn't you know it, it was activists in Flint who were the pioneers of that. They were the first to file a complaint with the EPA Office of Civil Rights under Title VI to try and block the construction of a polluting facility, the proposed Genesee Power Station, uh, a wood-burning incinerator. Now you can see from this picture that they were not successful in stopping the construction of that facility. In fact, I think both my kids have been to see it. Right, guys? Oh, Flynn's, Flynn doesn't remember, apparently. But anyway, uh, it's on the northeast uh, side of town. Take my word for it. There it is on the map. Um, but it, it's, it's the reasons for their lack of success that we're interested in here. Um, when our civil rights laws were written, um, there were still quite a number of current examples you could point to of conscious, intentional discrimination against people on account of their race. Um, and the laws were meant to protect above all against that kind of discrimination. Now, nothing in Michigan environmental law explicitly said that it was okay to discriminate, and there was no smoking gun evidence of anyone trying to discriminate by building this power plant. So, the activists made their argument on the basis of Title VI's so-called disparate impact provision, which holds that even a policy that's neutral on its face, right, so in theory it applies equally to everybody, even that can in practice have a disparate impact on groups that are protected under civil rights law. If those groups suffer a greater burden of pollution, as a result of the normal functioning of the permitting process, whether or not anyone intended that, that's discriminatory. At least that's the argument. So the complaint was filed, and then the wait began. You can see the people who uh, were part of the organizing effort here. Uh, we'll come back to Father Phil in, in a couple more slides. Um, so they filed the complaint, and then they waited, and they waited, and they waited, year after year after year, for the EPA to make any kind of ruling whatsoever on that complaint. In the meantime, the facility was built and began to operate. Right? While they were waiting for the EPA to finally chime in, another company, the Select Steel Company, came along proposing to build yet another polluting facility in the same area. In this case, it was a steel recycling, what they call mini-mill I don't know how many you have to be to be a mini mill, but anyway, it was called a mini mill. Um, and so uh, these folks filed another complaint. In this instance, EPA responded pretty promptly with its first ever ruling on a Title VI complaint. So this was historic. And you can probably guess what's coming. It found that approving the permit for the mill would not violate anyone's civil rights. And its, reason, its reasoning was precedent setting. Um, it established what's referred to in the legal world as a quote unquote rebuttable presumption. I know that term doesn't really help, but the presumption is this. Um, if a company can show that it's complying with existing environmental laws, that its facilities are not going to release any more pollution than is permitted by those laws, it is by definition in compliance with civil rights law as well. It may be that the pollution it creates has a negative impact on people of color, but that doesn't rise to the level of discrimination unless an environmental law has been broken. So these two cases out of Flint, the Genesee Power Station case and the Select Steel case, offered the first glimpses of how EPA was going to have, handle civil rights complaints. Namely, they would either languish or they would be shot down. And that's exactly what happened um, as new complaints started to roll in. So this is uh, coming from a 2015 analysis by the Center for Public Integrity that found um, that uh, 162 of these complaints were rejected outright by EPA, meaning you know, they didn't even look into them. Um, 38 were accepted but didn't end up getting any kind of a formal review. 
and 64 were accepted and reviewed, but in none of these cases did EPA find that there was a violation of Title VI. So the, the civil rights road that the environmental justice movement was hoping to travel down was looking like a dead end at this point. Okay, so what about this idea of uh, putting different laws on the books or different rules or whatever that are stronger? Um, what if there was a way to evaluate the impact of something like a new steel mill by looking not just at the emissions from that mill and whether they complied with environmental laws, but by putting those emissions in context, looking at the cumulative health effects of uh, a population was already facing from existing facilities as well as other factors? What if we made it legally forbidden to keep piling pollution onto already disadvantaged people, even if it's just a little bit more pollution. At what point does a community get to say no more? Well, you know, in some ways, that's really the holy grail of the environmental justice movement. It's giving communities the ability to say no more. We're dealing with enough issues as it is. Thanks very much. We don't need another, you know, recycling plant or whatever in our community. Um, but it's, it's, it proved to be pretty difficult in the 90s and beyond to get any kind of cumulative impact provision embedded into uh, law. EPA wouldn't even release a scientific framework for doing cumulative impact analysis. So we don't even know how we're supposed to do the analysis officially of that. Um, so that cumulative impact route too was looking like a, a dead end. How about resources? That was the third thing, remember. How about resources for addressing environmental disparities in EJ communities? Well, yes, there was an Office of Environmental Justice now, but it remained a pretty small and marginalized office within EPA. Its environmental justice grant program had for a long time about a million dollars a year to work with, which is like nothing. It doesn't even register you know, if you're looking at the federal budget. Um, and my friend and colleague, uh, Jill Harrison, has shown in her work that for most of the past few decades, there's actually been quite a lot of resistance within EPA to prioritizing environmental justice. There are a lot of people in the agency who see it as being not just practically difficult, but as being outside of or even in contradiction to the agency's mission as being, uh, there's a great quote in her book where somebody says, uh, what we do at EPA is ecology, not sociology. <laughs> as soon as you start talking about justice, you're talking about sociology, and that's not what we do. We do you know, statistical analyses and stuff of chemicals. Um, so uh, anyway, so uh, this bureaucratic you know, culture within the agency acted as a kind of break even on EJ-related initiatives that the agency could have undertaken. And as for other federal agencies, remember all those other agencies that Clinton said were supposed to be thinking about environmental justice? Well, that kind of became a suggestion over the years, right? Because there wasn't really anything concrete that they were being required to do. And so, you know, it was basically totally up to their discretion as far as whether or not they took environmental justice seriously. And in practice, it ended up down the list of priorities. So that was basically the state of things prior to 2015 or so when uh, Flint came along. Now to the second wave. After the Flint water crisis, the spotlight was shining on environmental justice issues in a way that it hadn't been for some time. We started seeing articles appear. Here's, here's some examples. There are many more. Um, about how environmental justice was finally getting its moment and so forth. Um, now, of course, there was a bit of a speed bump in 2016 uh, with the election of everyone's favorite president. Um, some people who supported his candidacy were actually proposing to eliminate the Office of Environmental Justice entirely. Um, and I remember talking with EPA folks um, during those four years and um, they were about ready to jump out the window. Um, they, they didn't really feel like they could do any part of their job, uh, much less the environmental justice part of their job. Um, so the, the Trump years um, slowed the upward trajectory of environmental justice at the federal level for sure. Um, but even before Trump took office, there was some movement. And as we'll see, um, things really accelerated when Biden took the reins. So how about on that civil rights front? Can we use existing civil rights law 
to uh, enact our environmental justice priorities. Well, on the last day of the Obama administration, um, yeah, I mean, literally, this came out at like the last possible moment it could have. <laughs> um, the EPA finally ruled on its oldest Title VI complaint, the Genesee Power Station complaint. And believe it or not, it actually found that racial discrimination had occurred. That alone was a really big deal. Um, but there is a big caveat. It didn't find that there was disparate impact. What it found was that discrimination had occurred in the process of uh, public comment on the permit. In other words, it focused on how the decision to approve the permit was made and, and on whose voices mattered within that process. So, you know, that was far from everything that the activists were looking for, but at least there was now precedent for EPA to make a finding of discrimination. So next, there was four years of darkness <laughs> where nothing happened. But um, just before Biden came in, um, there was an important federal court ruling on a case brought by, among other people, Father Phil Schmitter, who you saw in that earlier slide. Uh, he was one of the key figures in the Genesee Power Station struggle. Um, this finding ordered the EPA to finally get serious about dealing with civil rights complaints. It couldn't just leave people hanging. And so that's at least part of the reason why um, Biden's pick for EPA administrator, Michael Regan, came into his position very vocal about how the administration was going to breathe new life into civil rights enforcement at EPA. He combined, as you can see on the right here, where'd my pointer go? Um, he combined the uh, Office of Environmental Justice with the Office of uh, Civil Rights and elevated this new office to the status of the most important offices in the agency. And he insisted that these civil rights complaints were gonna be taken seriously and acted upon swiftly. So once again, we've started to see activist groups on the ground actually testing that out. Does he mean what he says? And once again, Flint has been punching above its weight. A couple years back now, local activists got wind of a permit uh, application by the Ajax Asphalt Company to our State De Department of Environmental Quality, which is now called Eagle. As you may know, it was rebranded after the Flint water crisis. And doesn't that sound lovely? You can imagine this protective eagle, you know, soaring over all of us. Um, anyway, uh, not to be too cynical about it, but uh, they applied to Eagle for a permit to put uh, this asphalt plant basically right next door to the Genesee Power Station. Um, actually, you can see how close they are here. They're like what amounts to about a block away from each other. And a new coalition of groups um, joined forces. And it's a very interesting coalition. It's um, some of the folks from the old days, um, like uh, fa you know, Father Schmitter and his allies, but it's also new groups that have come out of the Flint water crisis. And they're tackling the next environmental justice challenge here in Flint. Um, like the environmental transformation movement of Flint, which um, I'm personally uh, involved with. Um, so uh, among the strategies that this coalition adopted was to file a new Title VI complaint with EPA. Let's test this out. And, and so you know, there were a lot of symbolic and practical connections here with the whole history of the EJ movement and EPA and the civil rights strain within all of that. And you better believe that the EPA folks who got that complaint from Flint knew about that history and they knew that this case was going to be a big deal, and it was going to be heavily scrutinized, and it was going to be precedent setting and all of that. So this should be their moment to shine, right? This is their moment to show that they've changed. Um, theoretically, you know, they could step in and say to Eagle that citing yet another polluting facility in this overburdened area right next to a public housing development, uh, will create an unacceptable disparate impact on the local population and that this violates their civil rights. Well, it didn't quite work out that way. Um, Ajax fought back. It really wanted to build that asphalt plant, as you can probably imagine. It insisted that it was doing everything in accordance with state and federal environmental law, 
And Eagle said, um, look, our hands are tied here. We can't you know, deny their permit just because the locals don't want another facility next door. And if you, EPA, want us to do some kind of cumulative impact analysis, you've got to explain what that's supposed to look like and how it's consistent with the law. So long story short, EPA did not shoot down this permit. The permit was approved. The factory was built. In some ways, that's the same old story. And that's game over, right? Well, uh, EPA did at least try to find some middle ground by approaching the a situation as a dispute resolution scenario. What it did was it, it brought the people who filed the complaint to the table with Eagle to try to broker an agreement that encompassed at least some of their demands. Um, and those would have included significant structural changes to the way that the state gives out these permits, you know, all, all over Michigan. Um, and there seemed to be strong indications at first that, that that really could happen, that that was a possibility, that these activists were going to be able to leverage this case to make that structural change at the state level. After months of negotiating, though, the end result uh, was what the coalition described as, quote, I know there's a lot of text here, a watered-down resolution agreement that makes only cosmetic changes to the state's air uh, permitting program, allowing the state to continue its historical practice of pa packing dirty industries into low-income communities of color. And you can see some of the disappointment also here on the right-hand side of the screen with these quotes. I've got Nayira uh, here saying that, you know, we invested all this time into this uh, negotiating process, and uh, then they squandered it. At the end of it, Eagle just washed their hands of us so they can continue serving their real constituents, the corporations. And here's Mona from ETM Flint saying, we had high hopes, we were finally gonna fix the environmental discrimination, but they're all talk, those people at EPA. Um, so the disappointment is palpable here. Um, and it's so strong because the activists had felt like momentum really was behind them under the circumstances. As Mona put it in another context, she said, I felt like we were on the brink of something great, and then it's just gone. And she's not the only one feeling that way right now. The critical context for that asphalt plant decision was that just beforehand, the EPA had abruptly closed uh, multiple civil rights complaints in Louisiana's infamous Cancer Alley, terminating similar negotiation processes there after the Louisiana Attorney General sued the agency. Um, and he was challenging, in part, the whole idea of disparate impact as a basis for even a negotiated settlement. And for decades, um, conservatives have been trying to get civil rights enforcement limited to instances where there's demonstrable intent to discriminate. And so the, the, the fear right now is that given the current composition of the Supreme Court, if one of these kinds of challenges, like the one the Attorney General filed, gets all the way to the Supreme Court, all the way to that level, then Title VI as we know it might go bye-bye. Um, so, you know, what the EPA seems to have decided is that in order to protect the civil rights law that we do have, um, you, you can't kick the hornet's nest too hard in cases like this. You have to tread very lightly so that people don't get serious enough to sue you all the way up to the Supreme Court. So we seem to have reached another kind of impasse with civil rights. What about the stronger rules and regulations? Well, one of the things that people in Louisiana and Flint were calling for uh, was stronger rules around how impact assessment is done and an insistence on cumulative impact assessment, as I said before. And again, one of the reasons why that didn't take off back in the day is that there wasn't really a strong scientific framework for doing that kind of assessment. And um, by the way, we're still waiting on EPA to um, release that framework. They were supposed to do so on September 30th. And here we are in November, and we're still waiting. We've <laughs> been waiting for decades now for that to happen. Um, but there's been a lot that actually has happened at the state and local levels on the cumulative impact front that's worthy of mention in the meantime, beginning with some, the development of some pretty rigorous tools to measure and map impact. So, this is a very influential example called Cal Enviro Screen, and you can see here that 
um, with this tool, they're looking not just at environmental exposures and their effects, um, they're also looking at underlying population characteristics, like what kinds of health conditions are prevalent among the population, what kinds of socioeconomic factors might be holding people back and making them more vulnerable, um, and so forth. So this is the idea with cumulative impact, is that we're looking at all of the factors together and how they intersect. Um, so it's in part because of the development of these kinds of tools that some states and even cities are getting bolder with the kinds of laws that they are enacting, as well as the permitting and enforcement decisions that they're making. Um, after the passage of a cumulative impact statute in Minnesota, the state identified an overburdened area of Minneapolis uh, where different rules now apply if you want to build a polluting facility. And uh, something similar is now true in, in Newark. In Newark, there's an ordinance now um, requiring cumulative impacts assessment as part of any proposed development uh, project. At the state level in New Jersey, there's a new statute allowing the state to deny permits uh, to projects that would exacerbate cumulative impacts. But what's getting um, arguably even more attention right now is what's going on in Chicago. The Chicago Department of Public Health recently actually did deny a permit. Again, I know it's a lot here, but if you look down here, you can see the final judgment. Um, they actually did deny a permit to a recycling plant on cumulative impact grounds after there was considerable public outcry. So in a case like this one, we're, we're getting pretty close to sort of the dream come true um, with government taking the side of the overburdened environmental justice community, even when it means thwarting the designs of a powerful private actor. Um, whether that example ends up being emulated elsewhere will be a big factor in determining the size and extent of this second environmental justice wave. How about resources? finally, um, for environmental justice priorities. Where are we at with that? Well, in some ways, this is the biggest story of all. Part of the legacy of the Flint water crisis, in my view, is that it helped to raise expectations about the size and scope of governmental response in scenarios like this. It took longer than it should have, um, but eventually there were a large number of government agencies involved in Flint and there was a $100 million aid package that Congress uh, passed, as well as other kinds of federal and state financial support for the recovery effort. Now, I'm not saying that it was enough to address all of the issues in Flint, but it was, a pretty, it was pretty serious money, uh, you know, as well as non-monetary resources that came Flint's way. Um, most environmental justice communities historically have not gotten that kind of help. So um, communities that have had environmental justice issues crop up since Flint came to national attention have understandably come to expect a similar level of government intervention and help. So expectations are rising, and that's why I don't think that it's any surprise that we're in the midst of the largest federal investment in environmental justice in the history of this country. Um, as you might have heard, the Biden administration has made it its goal to direct, quote, 40% of the overall benefits of certain federal investments to disadvantaged communities that are marginalized, underserved, and overburdened by pollution. And it's calling this the Justice 40 initiative. So this encompasses a wide variety of programs, things that are seeking to address issues like climate change, clean energy, water infrastructure, it encompasses many billions of dollars, uh, given the recent passage of the Inflation Reduction Act, um, the bipartisan infrastructure law, the American Rescue Plan, there's a lot of money floating around right now that qualifies. Um, and this is, uh, it's not just at, at EPA that they're affected by this, it's across the federal government. So Biden now, like Clinton, has authored, uh, uh, or signed anyway, a couple of, uh, environment, uh, of executive orders, making it clear that, no, we really mean it. Every federal agency needs to be making environmental justice a priority. And you know what? We're going to score you guys now. And that's all the way down to, you know, the Small Business Administration and uh, uh, what are some other implausible ones on here? 
the Department of Homeland Security, I mean, every department is supposed to have an environmental justice plan, and um, they're supposed to report what they do in a way that it ends up on this website, and you can actually track what's going on, right? So never had anything quite like that uh, before. Um, the Office of Environmental Justice and Civil Rights at EPA is flush with cash like never before. Um, it's doing a ton of hiring right now. It's giving out a bunch of environmental justice grants to community organizations. It's funding what it's calling environmental justice technical assistance centers. That's bureaucrat speak, but anyway, um, these, these are supposed to provide various kinds of support to groups that are working on local EJ issues, and they're all over the country. There's one in every, sometimes more than one, in every EPA region now. So, you know, all of this investment looks pretty impressive on paper, but of course there's a big difference between pushing money out into the world and ensuring that people are actually, quote unquote, benefited by that. And that's one of the big questions right now. Who gets to decide that a community has benefited from federal investment? Shouldn't just be the feds, probably. Um, how is that going to be measured? How are we going to make sure that this money and assistance finds its way to the right people in the right places? The amount of money directed Flint's way uh, looks impressive on paper, but the, in the eyes of many community members, it didn't always get well spent. Furthermore, uh, looking ahead to 2024, how much of this momentum can be sustained if the political pendulum swings back in the other direction? Well, um, we have some idea already, I think, of what's likely to happen if we get another four years of you-know-who. Um, you can read about it on the so-called Project 2025 website. This is the brainchild of the Heritage Foundation and other conservative groups that are trying to dismantle what they call the administrative state and purge federal government of any kind of uh, social justice priority. And environmental justice gets mentioned a few times uh, in their publication, Mandate for Leadership. And you can see here on the right that uh, one of the things they call for, uh, referring to EPA, is that, quote, allocations of agency resources be based on, quote, neutral constitutional principles. So, you know, given that elsewhere in this uh, book, Justice 40 is described as being a potential vehicle for a politicized agenda, you can probably guess whether um, that's going to be considered a neutral policy. Um, what I think we, we would probably see is that any kind of funneling of resources to particular communities um, on account of how disadvantaged they are, which you know, is supposed to be all about combating discrimination and the legacy of discrimination, will uh, be characterized as itself a form of discrimination. Um, just like uh, you know, prioritizing African-American students supposedly means unfairly discriminating against white students. You know, we just had a big Supreme Court ruling to that effect. Um, so, uh, and you can see further down here that the idea is really to put a pause on all EJ and Title VI actions, you know, until we can sort out uh, who's really being discriminated against here anyway. Um, so, you'll also find in this book a proposal to eliminate the new Office of Environmental Justice and External Civil Rights. Um, effectively relegating both the environmental justice program and civil rights enforcement back to their marginalized positions within EPA. So, uh, you know, judging by current polling numbers, uh, these possibilities are not far-fetched. So the, the future of environmental justice is by no means certain. Um, in the past several years, the EJ movement has gained some huge ground but it's also suffered some pretty significant setbacks, and there might be more coming down the pike. Um, looking at all of this through a Flint lens is instructive, I think, um, not only because the successes and the challenges in Flint dramatize kind of both ends of the spectrum, right, both possibilities here, um, but because Flint has been such an important protagonist in the history of the EJ movement as a whole and I suspect that that will continue into the future. <laughs>
And with that, I'd like to say thank you very much. And I'd love to open things up for conversation if people have any questions and or comments. Insults are fine too. Anything, anything you got? Conversations, intellectual conversations, not yelling about personal beliefs and stuff, but look at the data, look at the facts. So, questions? Yes. As the United States tries to rebuild its infrastructure, um, economic, sorry, economic, environmental reviews are a part of that process. So they impact the building freeways, um, rail lines, etc. Is it possible to balance um, fair and just environmental policies for all communities? but as well having cost-effective infrastructure that doesn't take decades to build? That's a really good question. Um, I don't know. <laughs> um, I mean, it depends on what kinds of projects you're talking about, of course. Um, some projects have more impact than, than others, more disparate impact than others. Um, and, and so, you know, in some contexts, like in the transportation context, it's you know, it's actually quite possible to do a disparate impact analysis, and that's, that's something that happens reg regularly, is that Title VI is used in that context, and it might defect, uh, you know, affect like a route that a bus is line is taking or something like that, and, and you can do that, right? Um, but, you know, in a case like that, you don't have powerful private interests that stand to lose something from people taking something like Title VI seriously, right? That's part of the difference with some of the cases that we're talking about here, that you know, this company Ajax in Flint was facing the prospect of not being able to build its asphalt plant, and that affects its, its bottom line. And so you know, when you try to get serious about enforcing these kind of justice priorities in that context, you're gonna end up in a big fight. And again, that's a fight that you could very well end up losing you know, g given the larger legal context and so forth here. So you gotta be very strategic about that. Um, but, you know, it, it, asphalt has gotta get laid. I mean, un unless we, <laughs> uh, we find some other way, that didn't sound right, but uh, <laughs> unless we find some other way of, um, you know, figuring out how to move people around from <laughs> place to place in this country. Um, and so, you know, the question is, how, where do we build these plants where you know we're not going to end up you know creating more disparate impact and one of the things that is supposed to be part of this all this negotiation and stuff is that any company that's proposing to build the plant here and not there is supposed to do like an analysis of what its alternatives are like it's supposed to have to explain why it needs to do it here and not there right and, and, you know, it's possible that if some of these cumulative considerations get factored in to that kind of analysis, then you could end up seeing some different decisions being made. I mean, part of the problem right now is that nobody's doing cumulative impact analysis, like, because no, they're not being pushed to do that, right? So we don't actually really know, you know, how different the outcomes would be if that started getting incorporated in a robust way. And I think that's um, one of the things that, you know, will be determined by this second wave is that, is this stuff actually gonna end up making a difference when it comes to which facilities end up where and whether they get built at all. In Chicago, it made a difference. I mean, that's why people were so struck by the sh that Chicago example, because that was a, a Department of Health actually saying, y you're not getting your permit. I, I mean, that happened like one time in American history, <laughs> right? But like everybody's freaking out about that. Well, oh, you know, on the, on the private sector side, they're saying, well, this is dangerous. We're not gonna be able to do anything. Well, I don't know. It's one time, <laughs> you know? So maybe we try it out and we see how far it goes. I don't know if that answered your question, but I, I'm sorry, I saw Flynn's hand first. If, uh, if, oh, okay, <laughs> but that's fine. We'll get back to you. Thank you, Jason. Great talk, thanks. Um, I just have a quick question. I know this is con concentrated in a US historical, historical perspective, but I'm wondering globally, is there any countries that are doing it right? That's a really good question. 
Um, you know, as far as the whole environmental justice frame, framing goes, um, it's definitely more salient in some you know, parts of the world than, than in others. You know, here in, in the United States, as I uh, alluded to in my talk, it's very much bound up with kind of the whole history of our racial divide um, and the civil rights movement and so forth. And, um, you know, again, in the early days, people thought that what they were really talking about was environmental racism specifically. Like, environmental justice is a more generic sounding term. And one of the reasons why we're using that term now in, instead of uh, environmental racism is that poor white folks started to say, well, hey, wait a minute, what about us in our communities? communities? We've got some of the same issues over here. How is that racism? That's something else. It's still an injustice, but it's, we need another term, right? Um, so, you know, it depends on what kinds of inequalities you're dealing with, you know, in a given social context. So, uh, you know, th there is something of a global environmental justice movement, um, and there are relationships. I mean, even at that first People of Color um, summit that I referred to back in 91 or whenever that was, um, you had some people like from Latin America, you know, where there are also some very severe, you know, racial divides and social inequalities that came and participated in that because there was this obvious connection between the different struggles. And so um, that would be an another part of the world where I would say environmental justice really is a very salient thing and that is a frame that people use and so forth. But, you know, it's getting used in places where things usually aren't go going right, right? And, and in places where things are going better, you know, you, you just don't see much environmental justice sort of analysis going on to begin with. So it's hard even, it's, it's hard to say. I mean, it, it, we could disaggregate the United States a little bit more and uh, just look at, you know, um, where you tend to see environmental justice being taken more seriously. And, you know, I mentioned some examples of that. You know, they tend to be some of the states that probably don't surprise you. I mean, states that are left-leaning, that are open to the whole justice thing to begin with, because it kind of follows, falls under that umbrella of social justice, right? So, you know, in area, places where social justice in general is being taken seriously, it's, it's easy to kind of slide environmental justice in there, right? Um, so it helps if you have some kind of a social justice, you know, tradition. But, you know, it's taken a while for that whole angle on environmental issues really to catch on. You know, if you think of like the big environmental movements in Europe and so forth, right, they weren't really talking about justice in this way. It wasn't about social justice, justice between people per se. It was about humans and nature, right? And so, you know, from my perspective, environmental justice is Sometimes it's characterized as, as like the next phase of environmentalism. I don't think that's right. I, I think it's, in a, it's a kind of social justice struggle that we're talking about here, right? So I don't know, I feel that was a very unsatisfactory answer to your question, I think, Julia. <laughs> but let me think about it some more and, and come up with some better examples. Oh, yeah. Yeah, well, and, and actually, I mean, this is academia, but um, one of the leading theorists of environmental justice, David Schlossberg, um, teaches in, I think he's in, Aust it's either Australia or New Zealand. He's somewhere down there. I know people down there wouldn't want me to confuse the two, but, um, but anyway, um, yeah, no, I, I mean, the, the issues are very salient there for exactly the reasons you mentioned. Thanks so much, Ben. Uh, I, to me, the legal strategy is fascinating and my first encounter with EJ was associating with a pretty novel legal theory that the environment was a thing mm. that could be done justice or injustice. Okay. And the implication yeah. then is that the environment could be somehow a plaintiff yes. in a law case, to which yeah. I, this would have been Obama's second administration, so 10 years ago, to which I thought, well, that has a kind of poetic nobility to it but I can't imagine what law firm is gonna try to take on that case because well, of the way federal and state statutes work. Yeah. Um, yeah. What you're talking about, as you just mentioned, is something very different, which yeah. is something like social justice as it intersects with environmental yeah. issues, Absolutely. which raises a whole nother set of hairball issues with the way federal statutes work. It doesn't surprise me that Title VI is a dead end and disparate impacts is a dead end 
because you've got a combination of a federal judiciary which has been abandoning disparate impacts for 40 years. Yeah. Look at the recent voting rights cases, which is the place where you would have, you would expect to see the, the center of that. And we just had the North Carolina redistricting plan approved federal uh -huh. approval two years ago, was it, or whatever. So the whole federal judiciary is moving back from disparate impacts. At the same time, you're focusing on individual businesses. Yeah. And I have a kind of, I can understand the legal rationale when the businesses say, we comply with environmental regulations, and what they, of course, want to insist on is there are no impacts, right? If, because if we followed the, the regulations, that's right. You, and the state well, has yeah. immunized us from yeah. our legal liability, even if yeah. you get lung cancer, yeah. as long as my smokestacks have the required screens on them, I'm not legally liable right. for your lung cancer. So the yeah. individual businesses are, in, are incentivized by our pro-development yeah. statutory framework to deny all impacts. So the question yeah. that I have is, is there any discussion or, or initiatives, a, an alternative route to me that strikes me as 14th Amendment equal protection claims? Yeah. Because then you don't have to deal with disparate impacts because <laughs> then you go directly to the state and you talk about policy formation and you have yeah. the opportunity, I don't know what the likelihood is, of achieving strict scrutiny standard. Yeah. Right, because as long as you're at a as long as you're at a uh, rational basis development encouraging standard of interpretation, yeah. nobody's going to put that liability on the back of a company. But if there was some way to elevate it to a strict scrutiny standard where the racial component is the thing that is triggering the constitutional review, yeah, I would be I just be really fascinating yeah to hear i don't a lawyer i mean i talk about those different i'm out avenues. of my league i think in doing the legal analysis on that one um you know i will say that the implications of of going you know this other route with title six is that i mean interestingly enough race has fallen off the table at the federal level entirely um what they're so to do all the justice 40 stuff that i talked about um, where you know you're trying to make sure that 40 percent is of the benefit is going towards the marginalized communities um, they have developed a whole new mapping tool uh, there are so many mapping tools out there right now I can't keep track of them all but they had to make one specifically for that effort to show where in the country they were going to prioritize directing the resources and they could not make race a variable in in that framework because they knew that if they did that, it was not going to stand up to legal challenge. You can imagine what people in the movement thought about that. Wait a minute. We're talking about environmental justice, and you're leaving race out of your analysis of which communities need the resources? Yeah. 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 Yeah, that's a great question. Yeah, well, and I think that, um, I mean, what's going to be interesting to see is whether there's now a change of tack because, again, we've kind of reached another dead end with this, at least for now. Um, I, I really, sorry, can I get to Flynn's question real quick? Because yes. um, I okay. really want to make sure that I do that. Yes, is this Flynn. still on? Th there's a microphone for you to use. What if smoke gets into the water from factories? That is a great question. Well, um, <laughs> I think that that would probably be bad for the water and bad for people who are drinking the water and swimming in the water because bad for the fish. Bad for the fish, absolutely. Yeah, actually, you know, in this country, we used to have a, a really bad problem with acid rain, where. Um, chemicals in smoke would get up into the air, and then when it would rain, those chemicals would come down with the rainwater, and they would end up in lakes and streams and rivers, and that was really bad for the animals that were living there. And so um, the government made new laws that made factories have to put scrubbers on their big smokestacks so that when they were letting their smoke out, it got scrubbed of some of those bad chemicals and that was so successful that we really don't hardly have much of a problem with acid rain anymore in this country. That's why you never hear anybody talking about it. Not anymore. Not anymore. One time, time for one more question. So, uh, yep, Paul. There you go. <laughs> uh, thanks again, Ben. This is just really great. So I have kind of a political philosophy question that's a little bit, oh, great. Uh, yeah. a little bit abstract. 
Whew, uh, I gotta, that takes me back. But well, okay. but you started with um, democracy and sort of environmental decision making and the virtue of democracy. It might not be a great system, but the best we have. Yeah. I'm just wondering if you could comment a little bit on how that intersects with um, technical and um, complexity sort of questions, right? Because that's that's one I often wrestle with, right? Yeah. You know, like as we get more complex technological systems, yeah. how do we sort of like turn that over to democratic decision making? I think I want to address this through the lens of cu this whole idea of cumulative impact, right? Because on one hand, it, that's a very kind of popular demand. Like, look, you're, you're just going to talk about that one factory and not look at all these other factories whose smoke we're already breathing in and all the other crap we got to put up with in our lives. Like, that's a very understandable kind of uh, framework, I think, to the average person is like, you can't just look at one thing I'm dealing with here. You got to look at it all together, right? So, you know, and on, in some sense, I think you could say that's a very democratic kind of demand is to say, look, we want you to take all of that into consideration. But then when you start looking at how you're going to do that, man, does it get complicated <laughs> and technical really quickly. And what you need are the tools of not just one discipline, but like a whole host of disciplines coming together. And it just, it, it can get really arcane and hard to understand for people who don't have, you know, specialized technical training. And so, you know, one of the big issues here is, okay, I mean, let's say we're gonna take cumulative impact seriously. Once that analysis kicks off, what's the r role for the public to play in that analysis? And that's, that's exactly what, or it's one of the things anyway that I'm working on right now, um, is, is figuring out what is the role of the average person in the cumulative impact analysis process, right? And one of the things that I think it's really important to recognize is that we can't understand impact just by adding up a bunch of numbers and doing statistical analyses. When we're talking about how lead impacts people in Flint, right, we need to actually like talk to those people and figure out like what all is going on in their lives and how much their lives have been changed by all of this. And that would be true of anything. That's true of Legionnaire's disease. I mean, you, you can look at the statistics on who got Legionnaire's disease and who died, but that doesn't tell you very much about the, the impact. Um, you know, people in Flint, it's not just that they were drinking water with lead in it. It was that they, you know, they've been waiting for four hours in line to get bottled water and burning a bunch of gas and then hauling the cases of water into their homes and straining their backs and then worrying every time they turn on the faucets and worrying about their kids and all of that is impact. So if we're going to talk about impact seriously, we've got to take that kind of qualitative experiential data seriously. And that means we've got to find ways to get people involved in the impact assessment, but then also to be able to weigh what they tell us, you know, uh, right alongside that scientific data, <laughs> right? Um, so that it actually matters in the final analysis. And that's, that's a really tricky challenge in and of itself. And I, I, you know, I'm far from knowing how to do that. <laughs> but um, you know, I think that that element really can't get lost in, in all of this in part. And it's, it's, it's in part because we, just, we don't have a full understanding without it. Just on a level of knowledge, we don't know everything we need to know if we don't have people at the table. But beyond that, I think that's part of how d democracy stays in the process because you get people who are invited to tell their story and I explain to us you know, what, what all they have experienced. Oh, thank you for the good conversation. Let's just thank our speaker one more time. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, everybody, for coming out tonight. And um, if you got any more questions, please follow up with, you can follow up with Paul, chair of the Catholic Humanities Department, and he'll be happy to relay them. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much.